I'm here to introduce uh, Stev Svartz. He's here from all the way from Paris. Um, Stev has been a developer for a really long time, and he's held some super cool positions. He's worked with Steve Jobs at Next. Uh, Stev has been one of the first uh, certified Java developers. He's been, he was an advocate for .NET way back in the day, and so when I look at Stev, I really think that he's somebody who has seen the past. He's seen where .NET and Azure and Next and these, all these big companies have been, and, uh, and he's been a developer for so long that he knows where we're going and uh, is always looking towards the future. And so Stev is constantly building amazing chatbots for our team, for customers to use, for people to hack on at hackathons and really figure out and understand the chatbots. And so uh, I think you guys are very lucky to be here today for one of his sessions. Um, afterwards, I would highly recommend checking out his GitHub. I am constantly in, in Stev's repos um, looking for good examples, and he is always creating them. So please welcome uh, Stev. Hello, guys. Yeah. Then. Thank you very much for the introduction, Austin. Uh, you'll see I have a French accent. Um, let me know if you prefer me to speak French. Uh, oh, I have to stay in the light. Um, then I have a challenge is to teach you everything I know about bots in 40 minutes. Um, and I think we can do that. Uh, I've, been, I've been playing around with bots for some time. Then the first part of the conversation will be much more about the basics about bots, but I want that to tell you about what gets difficult when you start building your bots and how you can get above those difficulties. How many of you have already built bots? Okay, a few of them. Okay, very of you. Okay, very good. Then for the new, the beginners one, if you want to follow along, you just create an account on developer.ciscospark.com. And from there, this is a classroom. My goal is ready to put you with, uh, to give you hands on. I will also show you some resources you can go to. But the first part of it, you, you, may, you may make it, uh, even if it's a large classroom. OK, then uh, you know me already. Um, I've been running operations at several companies also, which means that yeah, business is critical. And chatbots, I like them. I love them. Uh, it's a toy. Uh, we can have fun with them. But it can also be something very critical for an, an enterprise. And this is where the, this talk is going to. Um, then um, let's talk about bots, how I started with bots. This is my first bot. <laughs> uh, first bot with Cisco Spark. It was, it was Daisy. It, I named it like that. It was for my kid. She was six years old at that age. And you know, if you're six years, you're just trying to you know how to write your name, but you don't know about spelling, how to interact with the user interface, how to work with the keyboard. Uh, you don't know about spelling. And then I just created that bot that was engaging for my, for my daughter. And she was speaking to that bot, Daisy. And she was asking for, I want to see a dog. I want to see a cute cat. I want to see a cute cat and a cute dog together. And I realized after a few months, she was able to write pretty well because the tool was helping her when she was doing mistakes. She had to go back when she was doing a mistake and to move forward. And it was a very good educational tool. I didn't, yeah, then, and now today she's, she's second grade. Um, two years later, I don't know the name in, US school, but anyway, she's been learning now to write and to do spelling. And she's pretty good at that. And sometimes I'm saying, yeah, well, maybe it's because of Daisy. Then a bot can do that. Oh, it's still on my GitHub if you want to meet Daisy. And then uh, there's someone, uh, I'm in France. I have a good friend called DG. Um, he's, he works at Cisco, he's in Amsterdam. I met him last week, and he does crazy things with bots. And he's also giving a lot of trainings in Europe. And one of these bots is about giving him the camera. It's the entrance where he lives. Then that's one. I think he has connected his dishwasher. And sometimes his wife says, hey, why are we buying this new machine? He says, hey, look at that. It's got an API. Uh, I'm gonna, I will know when it's running around. And then he, he has something for his, for his toilets. How many times he flushes his toilets per day? 
okay? Then just imagine this is the internet of everything. It can be anything. When we do hackathons with Austin, we, we, we've been in Portugal. We had a great hacking company there. They were taking the, all the house was automated and they connected with bots. Okay, then that's, that can be what you do. You can also do something more technical. Then this is an example of a bot that extracts some technical information that's pretty useful for developers that work with Cisco Spark. We may use it during the demos. And another bot I'm using a lot is a Cisco DevNet bot. Uh, then this is what it does here. You just ask the bot what's going on now. Then see it here. Um, I will start a tool called Zoomit. If you don't have Zoomit on your machine, you should install on your Windows machine. You should install it. Look at that. It's pretty handy now. Everybody can see even at the back. Okay, then when you ask the bot what's going on now, you say, hey, DevNet Create is going on. And if you want to continue the conversation with DevNet after this show, uh, you just type next and you'll see what's going on in the next weeks. You have some comments like next 10 and you'll have the next events coming up. Okay. And um, yeah, that's it. Then think of those kind of bots more enterprise related. You go to a back end, you extract some data, and you push them back to the user. Okay. And then this starts the conversation. And now I'm going to explain you what it takes to build those bots from a developer perspective. And then first, you need to choose a platform. And for the purpose of these demonstrations, we will use Cisco Spark, which is Cisco's collaboration platform. It can help you create messages. That's what we will do a lot. But we can also create meetings and calls. And the classroom right after me will show you how to create a video application from scratch, just to integrate video into your existing apps. Okay. And that's the announcement we made in the keynote today. What about the platform we are using? The Cisco Spark platform is exposed through APIs, and we can, you can reuse them and leverage them without installing anything on your backend. You just leverage cloud services. For now, we concentrate on messages. Then first, you, select, you choose a platform. Second part is this platform needs to have an API and so that you can interact programmatically and say, I want to create a room, a space where I can chat. I want to create a message. I want to delete message. This is the important part of it, how you interact with, with the tool. But the other part is webhooks on Cisco Spark. And I'm going to explain now what is a webhook because this is the technology that goes behind and helps implement your bots. Then, when you create a bot, and you saw my bot working earlier, the Cisco DevNet bot, you ask a question, you get an answer. Then it's your code running somewhere, somewhere at your enterprise company or in a public cloud, anywhere. And the user is chatting. Then first thing he does is interacts. The cloud platform gets the messages sent from the person and then pushes it back to an internet, a publicly available endpoint on the internet. For that to happen, you need to create what we call a webhook to register where is your bot listening. Then this is the first part of the job. Second part of the job is when you get those comments coming, you just send them back. Then you post back. Okay. Then now let's get hands on and see how it works. We'll start from scratch. Then for those of you who created the developer, .ciscospark.com account. And the good news, developer.ciscospark.com is a developer program for Cisco Spark. And when you connect and sign in, it's exactly the same credentials than when you run Cisco Spark. Okay. And it means you only create one account. Then if you've registered, you should see your ID there with some information, your private token with which you can connect to an API. But here, what we want, we want to create a bot. For that, we go to My Apps. You just click this area, and you're being brought to a user interface when you can say, I want to create something new. You, you, you click the plus button. I got a lot of bots, OK? It's my, I'm being paid to create bots. I've got hundreds of them. 
Every time I do a conference, I try to create a bot for that. That's that's fun. You'll see. And then, oh, did I click the the wrong button? Then plus. Mm. Is it just released a new version of the portal this morning, coming with the announcement? Okay, let me find the link. I think we can have an add. Okay, then this will be the, the link you'll need to add here. Add bot. Yeah, the page hasn't changed. Okay, then just, just add that. The ex extension, add dash bot dot HTML, and you'll go to the page. And Austin, thanks for mentioning the developer portal team that we need to fix that. Then you give it a name, and it's gonna be mm, Daisy Only Better. Um, you choose an address, um, maybe Daisy2. Then your bot will be named Daisy2 at sparkbot.io. Yeah, it will be its unique identity. And all thing you need to create now is to have an icon. This icon needs to be five by five hundred twelve by five hundred twelve. Um, the best place to do that is to go to Place Kitten. Place Kitten is an handy tool. You just give him a size, and it gives you a cat of this size. Okay, then five one two by five one two is what I want here. Okay, then I just pick this address. Put that back here, Shoot, and I'm done. It's creating a bot identity. It means a machine identity. It's not a human behind it with its own credentials token. We're going to take this token. It's the way you can interact with the API under the bot identity, as if it was a bot typing the commands there. Did we lose something? Are you still there? Hi, Tim. Oh, did I? Oh, I pushed on a button, maybe. HDMI? Yeah. OK, I'm not supposed to do that. Sorry, guys. Then you pick that here. You've got an access token. You pick it there. You copy it, and you keep it in a safe place, because we're going to use it in the next step. Next step is to find a place where we're going to push our data as events happen in real time in Cisco Spark. You're chatting with your bot. Then let's say you're chatting with your bot. First, you'll connect to Cisco Spark with the same identity. Oh, the address for that is web.ciscospark.com. OK. Is it there? Web.ciscospark.com. On my side, I have installed, installed the, wi the Windows application. Then I'm already logged in. Then in there, you create a new space. And you say, I want to talk to my bot. And you, oh, it's the ID of the bot here. I'm going to put his name. Was it Daisy2? Daisy2. Daisy only better. Here she is. If you can't find her, you say Daisy2 at sparkbot.io, and you find the bot. And the bot is already discoverable by the entire universe. Anybody that knows the address of the bot can talk to it. Now what happens when I say hi? Nothing happens, because there's no code logic. Then I've got a bot. I'm talking to a bot. And I need to register a webhook so that it pushes my message. Let's do that. For that to happen, we're going to push our messages to a, an empty bin that will just receive all the information from Spark. The tool I'm using to do that is called is a free tool. It's called requestb.in. It's very handy. If any, o if any of you is keen on bots or doing interactions on the internet, it's just a place where you can push data flows, JSON payloads, for example, and see them going uh, around. Then here you click Create a Bin. I'm creating a request bin. See it there? I've got an ID, a unique ID. If at any time someone is pushing data there, I will receive the message. Then now we want Spark to push data. Here. How do we do that? We register the webhook. Then let's go back to Cisco Spark for Developer. I go to the API reference documentation. This is where I created my bot. And I will click on, oh, I have to pick my token because I'm going to use that in a few seconds. And then I, I will control click to open a new tab for the webhooks. Among the options here, 
I'm proposed to post. Post in REST means, in REST style, means creation. Then I will create a webhook. I will pick this line. And there, I've got an interactive interface that lets me place some REST calls towards the Spark cloud. Then I want to create a post request to this endpoint, v1 slash webhooks from Cisco Spark. I will place, press this button here, test mode, so that everything goes interactive now. Can you see the difference? Here it was documentation. Now it's live, interactive documentation. Then I can go there and say, hey, this token here, is the token, is my token, personal? Now I want to do actions to create the webhook under the bot identity. Then I will remove, I will keep the B report, and I will paste my bot account token. And now I'm creating a webhook under the identity of my bot. I keep Biro in the space. And then I give it a name. It's, uh, for sure, it's a devnet. Create first webhook whenever you like so that you can remember it. And the most important part is the target URL. Where are we going to push those messages? And guess what? We'll go to request bin. Then I'm picking it again. I go back there, and I paste my target URL. And now I'm pushing my message to this place. What am I pushing? Um, I'm going to push everything. Mm, everything is all, I think, and all events. And now everything that happens, or maybe only messages created, then it's either you want all events to be pushed to your webhook on only one type of events. You can show that. The documentation is pretty um, detailed. You can put a secret if you want to generate a NASH code for your JSON payload, if you want a NASH Mac signature, so that you can be sure that it comes from Cisco Spark when you get post a JSON payload. And you run it. Then now it's a 200 means success. I've just created a webhook. Then if I come back to my endpoint and I want to show what's going on, it says, hey, nothing's going on for now. Of course, I haven't pushed any message to my bot. If I go back to that room and I say, hello again. Nice to be here today. Oh. It's a bit cold, though. Okay, I have to say it's a bit cold. OK, then now let's refresh my page. I go back to request bin. I refresh my page. And what does I get? Oh, I get data. Look at that, HTTP data and my JSON payload here. What does it say? Mm, it's JSON. And the best way to see JSON is to have an editor or to go to an online editor. Then I will pick this editor. I will paste my the payload I just got. And I will refresh it, and I say, yeah. You just received from this webhook a message has been created and by this person, if I checked, it would be me, Steve Swartz. And here is the data associated with it. And you find some extra data okay, about the message that has just been sent to you. Then we just you've just understood that when you create a bot, it's about as easy as that, you create a bot identity, you register it on your messenger platform, and then the message flow to your bot. This is a connect thing. Next part, so next part of it. Let's see now what's come to your bot journey. Uh, first thing is generally in, in an enterprise, you'll be behind a DMZ. Okay, you won't be your bot won't be internet facing if you want to go to enterprise data. Okay, then the same principle that applied in the past, this address was an HTTP address, they will still apply, it will be exactly the same. Okay. Then you just connect them, you go to your IT shop, and you explain them, this is how, what I want to connect to. Next part is, where well, yeah, when I'm, I'm running my bots on my laptop, I need to code my bots, I need to test them in real time, and I 
don't want to deploy them every time I'm coding my bot. Then what I need to do is I need to use a tool that connects my laptop to the internet so that my laptop get exposed on the internet and the Cisco Spark platform can post to my bot. How does I do that? I use a tunneling technology. Then I spoke about request bin before, which is an ND tool. The second ND tool is ngwok or local tunnel. I tend to, st I started with local tunnel. I tend to like ngwok very much now. And it's your choice. All those tools are free. And you create what you do when you start a tunnel. It's just one line of code. You will just do um, ngrok HTTP port 8080. And when you do that, instantly, um, or not instantly, when I get back my command line. OK. Now I have an endpoint that has been created here. Can you see this address? It's an, it's an HTTP address redirecting on the internet, redirecting to my local machine. Then instead of connecting to request bin, you just connect to that address, goes to my local machine, and connects to my code. Very handy tool for bot developers. 99% uh, of those bot developers work that way. Then next part is how do we code the bot logic? I receive an event, and I have to don't do some processing and post back to the platform the answer from the bot. Okay. Well, it's either you write all that code, it's some kind of an API, it receives you post events to your bot code, then you have to take that JSON data, go into that data, check which kind of event has happened, and then create a connection to the cloud and push messages, then you can write all that code yourself, and we've got a lot of examples. But if you've got a good bot framework, it can be two lines of code. It can be as simple as bot, you create a bot instance, and then you got a bot on command, hello, and you receive the command that has been, when, it's, when the event hello gets fired in a room, you receive a command is instantiated, Oh, sorry, and then you pick, you can do something with your command, you get the message in there, and who has posted it, and this bot just answers hello, the person that has sent the message. Then hello, 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 hello. Okay, you can say hi, you can translate it, then you can call the next standard API, and you can start doing your job of a developer. Then this, this command is pretty, uh, we've created at DevNet a small bot framework called Not Sparkbot. It's very handy to take your first steps and to learn about that technology. And we've got a learning lab backstage where you can learn how to do this step by step. Um, but the community has been at work. And we've got two bot frameworks in the Cisco Spark communities that are very active in Node.js. It's Flint and BotKit. And uh, uh, the code will look very similar. You will always have some kind of a code that says, I want to hear for comments. And when they happen, you do something. Then it's two lines of code again. You hear for a command, and it replies. Everything is encapsulated in this bot framework. As a difference, whatever the platform is, I'm, or I'm talking a lot about Cisco Spark here today, but the same principles apply to all chat platforms. Then. In all communities, you will find different frameworks because developers, they, we love creating our own frameworks, and they're always better, and there's always something we don't like, and we create a new one. Then here, uh, we try to highlight what's important, and in our opinion, what's important here is about Flint is very focused on Cisco Spark. It's Cisco Spark only. It goes deep on Cisco Spark. It does a lot of things behind the scene, like some kind of retries, what happens if I send a message back, but the platform is not listening, and then you want to retry automatically? This is something that Flint and Node Sparky does automatically for you. And yeah, this is pretty handy. On the other side, we've got BotKit. BotKit is the number one community framework. It's got 6,500 6, stars on the GitHub. Uh, it's one of the 10th coolest projects on GitHub, one of the most 
well known. When I say tense, tense, uh, not among the big ones. Okay, we've got Apache and a lot of big actors. But if you go to the smaller projects, it's, it's one of the 10 biggest ones and, and the most active recently. Um, then it's, it's great because it covers several bot platforms. You can use the same kit to interact with, I don't know, whatever your platform is. Uh, Messenger, for example, then you can use the same platform to send your message and, uh, and create a, an interoperable bot. You can change chatting platform. Um, it, got, it has got a key value data store to store context, and that's what I'm going to talk about now because it's more advanced concepts, and also conversations. And this drives us to the next conversation, which is I know how you know how to build a bot. You use a bot framework, you create a webhook, but what happens next? And we've got 15 minutes left to discuss that. Okay, then. First thing is you want your bot to be pretty nice with people. Then when you're here for the conference, we've created a bot. It's called the DevNet Create Bot. Then you create a space called DevNet Create Classroom, and you'll just Invite the bot there, DevNet create, let's join the room. Kay. And other people, let's, let's invite Austin. Watch. Then I just created a room with those bots, and guess what? The bot is already talking to me. Then this is uh, what you want, OK? You want to know how you're going to interact with that bot. Um, at DevNet, we've been working with the Cisco Spark team, and we've been um, analyzing the submission we have for bots so that they, get, they can get registered and referenced at a marketplace that is called the depot, Cisco Spark depot, where you can find about bots. And what we saw is that we had to refuse some bot submissions just because the bot one didn't have a good user um, experience. And the first part is first you want a bot to welcome your users so that you know what you can do with that bot. Then here, see here, you say, hey, hey, I'm the DevNet Create Bot Conference. This is what you can do with me. Okay. That, that's great. How do you create that? Well, in fact, it's one line of code with BotKit. You just add that controller. You've got that controller on BotKit framework, and you say on, and you reply when you've got a message. And I'm the DevNet Create Bot. Okay. Every, all, all that code is online. You will just connect to GitHub, Cisco DevNet, and DevNet Create Bot. And you'll have the all samples. You know how to host it. You know how to run it by yourself. Okay, But it's two lines of code, and you've got your bot saying hello when he joins the room. And you all time. Next part is you want to make it simple for your users. What if someone forgets what you, your bot is about? You just help add an help command. When someone starts help, you give him some help. Next part, what if someone says something? Not correct. Let's say, for example, here I type, hey, I type, help me. Okay, this is something the bot doesn't understand. For example, what should happen there? In your opinion? Oh, first thing is here, I'm not mentioning the bot. Then here I will have to mention him. At DevNet Create, help me. This is some security feature we have in Cisco Spark that requires you to, when you talk to a bot, you need to mention him so that the bot can't capture everything that happens in a room. Because otherwise, he would take all your information and would be able to read them. Then as it's not a human, he's just supposed to take the messages when he's, men when he's mentioned. This is what I just did here by adding his name. Then it says, hey, help me. It says, help me. And it says, oh, I help you. What if someone now says, um, at DevNet Create, Toto, which is a French word which means foo, yeah. and says, hey, sorry, I didn't understand it. Try something else. And then, yeah, and then you want your bot to be pretty handy. Then you say, hey, DevNet Create, what the, the job o of your bot, its real behavior, is to tell you what's going on now. And now it's the mini hacks are running. It's apps mid deploy in Seattle, right there. And here we are running a classroom. Okay. Then this is the real behavior of your bot going on. Then don't forget the fallback command. I see a lot of bots that, that don't have a fallback command, and you're just trying to interact and to talk to the bot, and you don't know how to do it. 
Uh, again, it's one line of code uh, with BotKit. You just add at the end of your code. Uh, if I hear anything, you have add hello, hi, help, now, current, all the words you want, and the last one is anything else. And when if anything else is pressed, you just say, okay, you need help, guy, because you did not make it. Next part. The next subject is what most developers contact us for at DevNet is say, okay, that's nice, but I want to have richer conversation. And for that, a lot of people have heard about NLP, and they say, okay, now I will have to go to another platform to create something more sophisticated. I have to say it's not the case. There's a lot of situations you can handle with your own local code and bot kits. I will show you what. And then, what are user context? User context is this ability to say, hey, DevNet Create, show me the next maybe three events, next whatever you want. And here now I get the next activities, and it's got a number there. Which means that after that, I can type another command with a number, and my code will remember that that number references something I said earlier. This is pretty complicated to build because you need to have uh, some context. It's asynchronous and it's related to each, to each person using the bot. Okay? The number three for you will be different for Austin and from all the, any other people here because you have loaded different data. And that is something that BotKit does by default. It's just embedded in the tool. You can store data that has been gotten and store it in a user context so that you can reuse it later. And this is an awesome work job here. Second part is, what if your user just says about? Then now let's do it. It's going to be more fun. Then I ask DevNet Create, give me a b tell me about the next 100 activities. Okay. Then now I've got everything that's coming on till, till tomorrow. Then I want to know more about what we're doing, uh, maybe, oh, there's a chatbot. Okay, we, uh, we'll have a session right after, okay? About four, that's going to be a cool thing, I'm pretty sure. About, but what, what if I don't say four? I say about. When my bot, does, it's like a pizza, you don't know which pizza you want. You want to engage a conversation, a sub-conversation inside and say, hey, what do you want to talk about? Then. My bot just answered, hey, this is everything I had. It gives me my, my data back. Which activity are you inquiring about? What do you want? And then you say, hey, just answer the number. I don't have to say about anymore. I'm in this context of choosing an event. Then I just say, at DevNet Create, give me information about number four. And I'm good. Then sit there in those few lines of code. And you could just create a conversation, store information, enter subcontext, and you I did not use any third party tool that does NLP and guess my in information. Then this is what you can build today. Now I'm going to talk about what you can't find yet on the internet, what doesn't exist, and what propositions we can do and how we're going to build the future of bots. Then next question is who created that bot? What is the usage policy? Is it free? Is it paying? Does it need a license? Um, how can I contact support, send feedback? And what about that, the, the data? When I use code, I have a data. When I use something, I have creative commons so that I know the license that goes with the document. I know also the policy of websites, uh, the policy of when they use cookies to store my sessions. How is that bot is going to use my data? And this is a strong concern for anybody. Then. What I proposed here, I just added something very small to my bot. I said, hey, when someone says ping, you will just answer him some information about you. And says, hey, this is DevNet who created this bot. If you need support, you just call Steve. St and then you can say, I've been, it's been up since that time. There's a version. And if you want the code, you can just go there. Okay, it's just meta information. But there's no standard for that. that you, will have you will have to add it, and some the people will have to know it. What about you? we create a standard? And if we create a standard, what if it was exposed by the bot itself? Then now what I created, I say, OK, maybe someone 
wants to create an engine that goes and interacts with bots, then what if my devnet create bot, which is hosted on Aeroq, okay, where is that address? Mm, devnet create bot Aeroq app, okay. Devnet create, and it's a bot, it's not the API, bot. And now I can ping him. It's a bot, it answers to post events when I've got webhooks notifications, and now I just added a get event, and uh, I get the data. Isn't it nice? You don't have any tool anymore, you just get that data. What can I do with that? It's like a health check when you do operations. You need to enter that your program is running correctly. Then the next part is a lot of sometimes your bot is down. Just it doesn't answer. And I have a problem now. How can I ask my bot if he's alive or not? <laughs> then what if? And we have a lot of those conversations at, at Cisco saying, hey, who's created that bot? You're trying to find the person and all that. And the proposal is we're going to create a universal database in which we're going to reference the bots, but we won't tell about what the bot does. We will just put the metadata, just that info about that bot. Where is the health check? And then you will just ask the metadata bot, hey, is it running? Is it live? What are the licenses? It's all those metadata, okay? And to discuss that, we've got a session in 10 minutes from now, right there. And if you have been working around bots, I will be happy to dig into those ideas and what we're thinking putting in there. And I would lo love to have a community start this project and we, start, we decided to go for DevNet Create to start that, con that conversation. Next part is hosting. Hosting a bot, yeah. Hosting, at the end of the day, a bot is nothing more than an API. It receives post commands, get commands, then if you know how to create a website to protect it, it's HTTP. An API has got some ex extra best practices. When you create an API, you have to take care about authentication, rate limitation, caching, doing some logging, transformations. You can do that either inside your code by yourself, or by taking framework and embedding them in your code, or you can choose to use a reverse proxy Okay, some kind of HR proxy or Nginx. You add some plugins in there, and we've got the Kong technology. It's open source. That's it's all a bunch of plugins that come with, with Nginx, for Nginx for you. Another option would be to take maybe Caddy server. It's written in Go. I use it a lot, and you'll have some plugins you can add. Then you create the bot the same way I did today. You just add a reverse proxy in front of it and the reverse proxy will take care of security, rate limitation, and everything you want to protect your bot. That's what I suggest. Don't change the code of your bot to add even SSL. You want a, a remote proxy to do that for you, or yeah, just your web server. You don't want to add that into your bot. Then hosting. Um, the next part of it is how am I going to host that bot? There's a lot of options. It's a piece of code. It's like web. Uh, you can go. The main discussion I have usually is, who's going to pay for the bot? <laughs> Remember when we created those first mobile applications? It was mobile applications were just a toy. We had no money for it. You just say, hey, look at that. I've got a mobile. I can put some application there. And over time, marketing team said, hey, we want a mobile app. And they could invest hundreds of thousands of euros, of dollars for you people. Uh, OK? Then think of it, we are in the same ages now. It's the beginning of bots, and nobody wants to pay for them, but they are very useful, as I showed you. Okay, DevNet Create, how can I know what's going on? You just have to ask the bot, but who's going to pay for that? Then you need to find the best price for the hosting aspects. What I suggest is you go with, first, you want to go with free plans. I like to use AeroQ free dinos. It's your bots are just there, hanging. They take 30 seconds to respond so that they wake up, and then they are up for 30 minutes, and then they sleep again. Okay. It's very handy for a bot that you don't want anybody to pay for. They just have to wait a bit. There's another option I've been tested recently. It's serverless functions. If you've heard of AWS Lambda or Google function, Azure functions, what are they? Those are 
cloud platforms that help you run code, basic code, and they give you credits, a lot of credits, millions of invocations for free, two million for Google Functions which is pretty good because after that, for the next million, you get to pay 40 cents. I can pay 40 cents when I have more than 2 million calls on my bot, okay? And I will have a whole team taking care of hosting my bot and scaling it. How does that work? It's pretty, pretty easy. At the end of the day, a function is nothing else than an entry point. You call it, it takes a request and answers a response. If anybody has does HTTP, request response. You just encapsulate your code, and you say, hey, when I receive a post, I just go to botkit. When I receive a get, I go to my elf check, and then I just export that, and you're done. And now you're running your code. To deploy it, you will say, hey, I want to, from the command line, you want to say, hey, give me not too much memory. Okay, it's just a bot, I don't need a lot. You can have more if you need, and you want to add a timeout because by default, those one million invocations, they have to last 100 milliseconds maximum. If it lasts one second, you will eat 10 credits of your one or two million. Okay, then just make it short here. Imagine I'm going to an API that takes a minute to respond. It would eat a lot. It would eat a lot of my credits. Okay, then just always put a timeout, a small timeout there for your Lambda or Google Functions. Oh, and to finish it, I wanted to wrap it up with how can you build your bot and go to the next stage and pick the right bot framework, add your fallback commands, conversations, test is really challenging. Okay, then there are some testing frameworks that are coming. Choose the best hosting approach, challenge itself, challenge you or even host it internally, it's the same technology, but Nobody's ready to pay for that. And monitor your bot activity. Um, there are some bot frameworks and that do that. Um, bot analytics, uh, there are some others, just look for that. Uh, Google also just recently uh, proposed a Google Analytics extension that works for bots. Um, and for the last part is the natural language processing. Then I showed you how to create a conversation how to store user context. And it means that we can go pretty far when we interact with a user building that. Then what I suggest is you don't turn to NLP right away. NLP is guessing what the user means. The user wants a pizza, the user wants the food, and I can get that, or he wants to, yeah, I'm pretty good at that, okay? Sorry again. And then, I think it's really relevant, those NLP tools, when you are in a B2C scenario, when you're, when you're using something that talks to a real customer, like call centers. Because you've got someone joining a conversation and he just wants to start, you, you're starting the conversation, you don't know what he wants to do. But if you think of it, when you've got some enterprise business tools, the people are joining Salesforce, for example, because they know they want to know more about their deals they're working on. And we are enterprise people here. Maybe it's part of your code or your B2C. Then if you're B2B and it's internal tooling, you certainly don't need an NLP tool. And if you need one, just go to reza.ai. We mentioned it earlier, I think, uh, in another talk. It's a free way to do some NLP if you want to host it at your company. Otherwise, use one of those NLP tools or great, uh, a lot of them. Just make sure that it, it introduces an extra third-party service that can fail, and it lowers your total SLA, okay, because it's an extra step. Um, then, if you want to know more and practice with those bots, we've got a room just behind. You can learn. It's in 15 minutes, you will have your own bot running, and you bring your laptop, and we are here to help. And thank you very much, guys. I'm taking your questions. Right after this call, there's a talk, there's a classroom you about video SDK uh, by Jonathan. Jonathan, do you want to come and start installing there? It's awesome. This is the, Jonathan will tell us about the technology we introduced this morning. And I think that Austin can. Oh, Steph, we've got a question for you over here. Okay. Yeah. Um, with other uh, speech technologies, there are standards for grammars. 
Are th have there been any standards for uh, in the bot world for grammars? You're talking about Grails? Grammar. Grammar. Yeah, okay. like uh, GRXML, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Have there been any uh, movements on standards for the way to describe, you know, uh, what you're looking to listen for, for for a bot? Yeah. How can you build that? It were, are there any standards out there? Sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, standards for, uh, I think you're, you're sort oh. of touching on the language, natural language processing yeah, exactly. aspects of it. Okay. Um, the platforms, NLP platforms, uh, usually works with uh, the same concepts. What they do is uh, basically you describe some intents, what two people can do, the concepts, the terminology, you assemble them. Um, I'm not sure they have created any standardized way to do it. Um, they expose the APIs so that you can, you, can, you can work with those tooling. But for the Raza tool set, for example, it's a, an open source tool that can do those grammar processing and intent and, and they are cl cross-platform. And they made some connectors so that they could connect to API.ai from Google um, from, for to Facebook platform and to the different, different NLP services. Then, uh, but I haven't seen a standardized API to do that exactly. We have some for voice, how to define, you know, voice, voice ML, and we have standardized way to, to do that. I haven't seen it for both. I would be interested to, to continue the discussion and, uh, in, the, uh, what Thanks. Is it? in the board where we, yeah, we can take bots to the next level. Any other questions? Right, thank you, Steph. Thank you. Thank you again.